go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, there we go. How many times do I got to say it? It's got to be three, maybe. <laughs> Amen. It's always fun enjoying the presence of God. Glory to God, especially with what we read in the beginning. It really helps to know he's real. That always helps when you're praising a God. Amen. So uh, I just felt it on uh, felt it on my heart to share more of a, a, a brief idea, perhaps more so than a, than a full-fledged message, if that makes sense. Just talking about a concept actually from the Hav Torah this time around. So the title of the message, uh, Chesed, uh, Chesed, which is often translated love or loving kindness uh, from uh, Parsha Devarim, or words. It's the name of the Parsha for this particular week from Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 1, all the way to 322. So we are kicking off the last book of the Torah uh, before we celebrate Rosh Hashanah. Amen. And traditionally, we uh, read through uh, Rabbi Jake and maybe help you all out with more uh, info. If you'd ever want to see it in person. Uh, but uh, but yeah, the scroll is ro rolled and rolled and rolled in red verbatim um, f uh, throughout the Torah service of, of Messianic Shabbat services. And uh, I feel like I'm stumbling over myself a little bit here. And at the very end of the year, they rolled the scroll all the way back to the front. Right, there's no return to first page button on the Torah or like exit and restart. <laughs> yeah, it has to be manually wound. And uh, we celebrate it with, amen, yeah, it's just one long page. So, yeah, if that helps at all, five books on one page, that's a feat. Amen, and it rolls all the way back, and we celebrate with Simcha Torah, the joy of the Torah. And it's maybe the one time a year where you see people dancing around with the Torah um, and just rejoicing over the word of God. And so this is the last book before we do that. Um, well, maybe not us so much, uh, but uh, it's kind of little. But we could do it. We could do it. Amen. I would do it. Deuteronomy from, so just a little bit of fun fact here. Deuteros Nomos, the second law, is where we get the name Deuteronomy. But in Hebrew, the book is Devarim, is the name of the whole book, which means words. Uh, much of it is Moses speaking. Uh, recalling things that, that have already taken place in the first four books, mostly the children of Israel. And uh, so just a little bit of information there. If you ever wonder why the name is different, uh, that is where they got it. It is uh, Moses giving the law to the children of Israel, to the new generation, if you will, that is preparing to go in to take the land. Uh, finally, they made their way all the way back. Amen. Wow. Couple of little, amen, right? We can stop right there. <laughs> amen. So um, I feel like it's best that I actually not explain this. I'll come back to it at the end, but there you go. And we'll talk about it. <laughs> so, the, uh, so the main idea for the message this evening, uh, God does not resist his own word. He is faithful unto its completion, talking about this idea of chesed, the purpose of the, the, the message, if you will, uh, mostly just reading a passage of scripture here, is just really to emphasize and talk about this idea of chesed, what we understand to be the love of God, is this dedication that God has to the fulfillment of his word, and saying, I love you, for God is, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you, I will never turn back on my word toward you. I will never turn my face from you if my commitment is to keep my face toward you. If that makes sense. And so love is a very powerful concept when understood this way. It is indeed dependent and founded on a covenant, a covenant, an agreement, a relationship in that regard. So just talking about it a little bit, uh, again, from the Haftorah reading, actually, from this week. And just going to basically uh, read it just to give us something to think about, ponder, perhaps, for the Shabbat. And uh, we'll enjoy fellowship. So Isaiah chapter 1, verse 1. The vision of Isaiah, son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah 
and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Listen, heavens, and hear earth, for Adonai the Lord has spoken. The sons I have raised and brought up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner, and the donkey its manger, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Oi, uh, or, uh, or, or, <laughs> oh, man, I didn't catch. <laughs> Anybody, what, how they translate that? Sometimes it's low. Alas, there we go. Oi, that's the Jewish version right there for you. If you ever want an exclamation to add to your repertoire, go for it. Oi, they, right? Straight out of the Bible, who knew? Oi, a sinful nation, a people weighed down with iniquity. Offspring of evildoers, sons dealing corruptly. They have abandoned Adonai. And I would say to notice, it doesn't say that Adonai has abandoned them. Very big difference. They have despised Israel's Holy One. They have turned backwards. Where will you be struck again as you stray away more and more? The whole head is sick. The whole heart faint. From the foot to the head, there is no soundness, wounds, bruises, and raw sores, not pressed nor bandaged, nor softened with oil, a dire situation therein. Your land is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Your fields, strangers devour it in your presence, a desolation overthrown by strangers. So the daughter of Zion is left as a sukkah or a dwelling place in a vineyard, as a lodge, in a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city, uh, implying ruin and abandonment, um, not of God, again, but of the people. Unless Adonai Tzvaot, the Lord of hosts, had left us a small remnant, we would have been as Sodom, we would have been as Gomorrah. Only God is keeping these people from total destruction and being forgotten. Forever, Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the Torah, the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. Just observing as we pause. So Israel's covenant was their foundation of relationship with God. Consequence and reward is no longer a surprise. It can be fully expected. And then finally, in our lives, God speaks. He will not go back on his word. And this is such an important thing uh, in, in, in reading through this passage that I would say is uh, very, very uh, important to keep in mind, if I could be redundant. <laughs> in that when we see gods, we've been kind of talking about that a little bit throughout this evening, which didn't really anticipate, but it chimes in nonetheless. When we talk about gods and the pantheon of gods and, and so many that have existed before, perhaps one common denominator with them is you never know what they're going to do. You never know how they're going to feel. You never know how much sacrifice is enough, how much crops you have to offer, how many children you have to sacrifice to them, you know? Nothing is ever enough until it's enough, and you know because you know until you don't, and then you don't because it's bad, right? And that sounds weird, but is it not the way that it was? If we look at history, that's really the way it was. How do I know my God is real? Well, because I beat you in a battle. That's how I know. And then when I lost, maybe he's not real anymore. And it's, and it's crazy. It's crazy to live, to live life like that. Why would we say that? Well, there's no foundation. There's no foundation when we look up to the heavens. I'm just shooting an arrow to who knows who. Maybe it'll get there. Maybe it won't. Maybe he'll answer. Maybe he won't. And it's so beautiful that God chose to come down to the mountain, uh, first with Adam and Eve, but then to the mountain and, and talk with Moses. We read in Scripture, Moses saw God face to face. The greatest of all the prophets, uh, he saw God. God saw fit to come down and speak with humanity himself. And basically, to bind himself in an agreement with humanity. 
And some don't seem to like that idea very much, but I feel like it's just so important for us to keep in mind, and I just felt it in my heart to share it with you, that God is not afraid of being bound if he enters into it of his own accord. And some perhaps see that as a challenge to God's sovereignty, that God can do whatever he wants. And that is true, but will he is the question. Will he do whatever he wants? If he enters into an agreement with humanity, would he be just to break it? If he gives humanity promises, he gives humanity a covenant, and he says, this is the way that I agree to interact with you as a people, the nation of Israel. If he breaks his word, is he any longer perfect? Is he any longer worthy of our worship and sacrifice? And so he will not abandon his word. He will not forsake the agreement that he's made. And for us, really, I feel like it is no challenge to his sovereignty to say that he is powerful enough to keep his own word. And that he is honest enough and wise enough not to enter into something that would, that would be uh, a compromise to his character. But any agreement that he would enter into, any word that he would speak is fully perfect. And a fully perfect God keeps a fully perfect word to a thoroughly broken humanity. And we need that. <laughs> we need that so much to be able to look up to heaven and know who we're talking to. The whole point of a Bible, why have it if it creates no consistency? What is the purpose of it at all if not to give us something to look forward to, <laughs> something to look back on, to know God, what that really means to know God, to know his character. It's unchanging, never changing. And that's a beautiful thing, a beautiful thing. Verse 11, we keep on going. For what is it to me, the multitude of your sacrifices, speaking of the law, says the Lord, Adonai, I am full of burnt offerings, of rams, and fat of fed animals. I have no delight in the blood of bulls, or of lambs, or of he goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required this at your hand, trampling my cords? So it's not so much the sacrifices as it is trampling my cords, the Lord says. Bring no more worthless offerings. What makes them worthless? Right? We keep on reading. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Shabbat, the calling of convocations. I cannot endure it. Iniquity with solemn assembly. Your new moons and your festivals, my soul hates. They are a burden to me. I am weary to bear them. Again, this is God. God, who made, who made the new moon? And who made the festivals, right? But what is it that separates God's new moon, God's festivals, from theirs? When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. When you multiply prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Amen. Amen. We just think about that. I'm going to switch mics. <laughs> Amen. God's own law appeared a source of disgust to him, or so it seems. And why is that? There seems a, a greater element than just fulfilling requirements. God seeks the heart. And this idea that good fruit, uh, they grow from a good root. And just to talk a little bit about, about what that means. I uh, just, uh, just felt like it was an interesting idea. If we ask the question, how many times do you have to beat an apple tree until it'll make apples? <laughs> you don't have to beat it at all because that's what it's made to do. All you do is keep it alive, right? I'll come back to that. We talked about it uh, uh, some weeks ago, but our family actually uh, blessed us with an apple tree. It's a little baby one, and we planted it back there. And then Texas was just like triple digits every day, right? And the ground was just cracking underneath it like, no. And so we've been watering it a lot. Thankfully, there's like a little patch of grass now right under the tree and everything else is just brown. But the tree is still alive. 
right? We're so thankful. But it's, 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 really, it's really interesting and awesome that an apple tree makes apples. We keep it alive. We keep it. We give it sunlight. We give it water. But the making of the apples is what it's designed to do. And so it's as if God here, in talking with his own people, there is this idea that it's, I don't, I don't want you to just go out and do whatever and then come back to me, throw an animal on the thing, and then go keep doing whatever you want to do just because you know you can throw an animal on the thing. <laughs> I have enough animals to send for months now, right? I don't want you looking at it like that, man, right? They multiplied a lot this year. I got a lot of free passes to do whatever I want to do. Is that the way they were looking at it? It seems like it. It seems like it and, and not a good look like they say, not a good idea. And we read throughout the prophets, it was so dangerous, this idea of, of what, what we call syncretism or compromise. We worship the true God in the temple, and then you go into the walls where nobody sees, and they're worshiping a different God, right? And it's hidden, and, and no one knows what they're doing. But 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 we got both. We got both bases covered. We we have this God for when we need, you know, forgiveness. And then we have this other God when we're feeling a little more loose and we want to do whatever we want. And that's not the point, right? Could we all agree? Not the point. <laughs> not the point of giving giving the law of God. Not the point, but combining this with the idea of grace. And God doesn't leave them there. God doesn't leave them there. There's so much suffering that Israel put themselves through, really, uh, as a result of this that they did. Amen. But so thankful it doesn't end there. Wash and make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil, the Lord says. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Relieve the oppressed. Defend the orphan. Plead for the widow, as it were, those who cannot pay you back, the, the, the weak, if you will, the ones that you could ignore, that you could pass by, and it's arguably a chore to go beyond, uh, and I'm talking to myself, <laughs> too, first and foremost, it's arguably a chore to go beyond and say, I'm going to help somebody else. We don't always feel that way. We got a lot of problems. We all got problems, am I right? We all have challenges. And I wouldn't say that's a bad thing. We're all growing. It's good to have challenges. It's good to lift weights. That's how we keep our muscle mass. If we never lifted weights, if we never used our muscles, they, they, they atrophy. They waste away because they're not being used. A so challenge is a good thing. Challenge is a good thing. But embracing the challenge, embracing the beauty of of serving those who need it the most. Come now, as many of us may have read this passage, we read it here. Let us reason together, says Adonai the Lord. Though your sins be like scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they will become like wool. It's really interesting. I came across this, and uh, it was just an idea, but it felt super awesome this idea let us reason together we look at the word the way that it's used in other passages of scripture another translation is actually uh to be to to be chastised or rebuked and it's really awesome perhaps to read it that way come now let us be chastised together if we remember isaiah 50 53 Later in the book, where we see this beautiful illustration of Messiah Yeshua and the work that he did for us. And to see a hint of it, even, even here, this idea of, of God saying, I want you to become righteous, but let's do it together. Let's do it together. Though your sins be like scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Why? Because I'm offering my blood this time for your righteousness I'm not leaving you to reach my standard alone, to reach perfection alone. But I'm willing to come and to come down and to help you along the way, to give you what you really need, 
which is a new heart, a new heart, right? White as snow, like wool, pure. If you are willing and obey, you will eat the good of the land, enjoying the blessing, the good part of the covenant with God. But if you refuse and rebel, you will be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And we just finish it up here. How the faithful city became a harlot. She once was full of justice. Righteousness lodged in her, but now murderers. Your silver has become dross, your wine diluted by water. Your princes are rebellious and friends with thieves. Everyone loves a bribe and chases after rewards. They do not defend the orphan, nor does a widow's case come to that. Therefore says the Lord God of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, Oi, again, I will get relief from my foes and avenge myself on my enemies. Then I will turn my hand on you, purge away your dross, and remove all your, your alloy, uh, excuse me, alloy, or mixed metal, impure metal. I will restore your judges as at first, your counselors as at the start. Afterward, you will be called city of righteousness, faithful city. Zion will be redeemed with justice, her repentant with righteousness. Amen. Amen. Seemingly impossible shortcoming did not stop God from offering hope to Israel. Again, if God was extremely temperamental, and emotional and impulsive as we perhaps read about other gods in mythology, how long would Israel have lasted with a god like that? Who's like, you made me mad. I'm just going to kill all of you. I have no obligation to keep any of you alive. Well, but you promised. Well, I don't care. I'm just going to not keep it because I just do what I want. But even Moses, Abraham, they they challenge God according to his character, according to his goodness. You said, but your character, what will they think of this God who does this? And does he rebuke Moses, rebuke Abraham? No, he doesn't. <laughs> no, he doesn't. But it's always his word. It's not our word. It's his word. It's his character. He helps us learn, helps us know him, what he's going to do. And that's awesome. He's not limited to our ability. They are his requirements after all. And this little question, do we follow the law of Moses or the law of God? Of course, uh, a little tongue-in-cheek there. We don't maybe often he hear it called the law of God, would you say? We hear it so often called the law of Moses. But is it not God's law? It's God's standard. It's, it's, it's what God naturally is. Without trying, waking up on a Sunday morning, God perfectly fulfills all 613 of them without the blink of an eye. Because it's in him. It's who he is. It's what makes him God, arguably. And it's so beautiful that he saw fit to share that with us. The standard of perfection. The beauty of his perfection, of his character, of his person. And just uh, toward a close in here, all the way over in First John, other end of the Bible. <laughs> Loved ones, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what is pleasing in his sight. Now, this is his commandment, that we should believe in the name of his son, Yeshua the Messiah, and love one another just as he commanded us. And love one another. The one who keeps his commandments abides in God, and God in him. We know that he abides in us by this, by the spirit he has given us. By the spirit he has given us. So just to throw it out there again, God does not resist his own word, but he's faithful unto its completion for our sake. But if it's all right to say for his sake as well, 
that he would be known among humanity as a faithful and a good God who keeps his word, who keeps his word, right? So just coming back to this picture for a little bit, <laughs> I felt like it was so powerful, so powerful. It's a, an organization called One for Israel. I don't always describe the places where like glean things, but just never heard it this way. It was so impactful. I just desire to share it with you. Um, cause I didn't think, I didn't think of it <laughs> is the point of saying that they, uh, they took this, they're Israelis and they described it in a way that, um, for a time, our relationship with, with God's perfection, with his law, with his standard was like a cage to a rabid dog or to a sick dog that the cage kept the dog in check, kept the dog from hurting other animals but it was never meant to cure or it was rather perhaps on its own unable to cure the dog but messiah the beauty of messiah is the cure for the dog and the relationship changes the dog no longer needs the cage in the way that it needed it before but the beauty of being cured is that when it comes to the dog, in this case, and, and the dog's owner or the dog's master, the dog doesn't need the cage to be beside its owner anymore. If there was this rabid uh, ferocity and viciousness to a dog that isn't well, versus one that's cured and that loves his master from the inside out, the end result is the same. Being with the master, but not in a cage, but being free, but still loving the Lord. And it's such a beautiful, beautiful subject that, that God's perfection, his standard, his character, his law, it never changes. It never fades away. But it's through Messiah that we are able to walk with him in the way that the law promised, in the way that his standard, his perfection demands because his blood makes us able to walk in it. And so we rejoice to do that. <laughs> we rejoice. Amen. We give God praise at least a little bit. Amen. That he takes his standard, his perfection, and he puts his character on the inside of us. We naturally live out as we are conformed to the image of his son, as we are conformed to the image of his word, to his covenant, to his beauty. We naturally live out by the power of his spirit, that which was demanded and even impossible in their own strength for those to keep that came before us. But so thankful that he offers us a fresh, new, beautiful life like these little puppies, right? That we can be born again, right? And be nice and beautiful, even though puppies and even babies don't look all that beautiful when they're first born. But once they get their fur, they look nice and cuddly for any that have ever been around, right? Uh, animals that are just born, even babies that are just born. We see uh, people laugh about it. They post it on social media. Like, don't show me a picture of your newborn baby, please. Looks like an alien. <laughs> until, until he or she's at least like eight weeks old or something. Please spare us, right? <laughs> But it's funny. It's the beauty of life. The beauty of life. Amen. Glory to God. So the hope, the hope, right? Oh, man. Baby Joseph might be mad at me. He might be, like, kicking me on his way out of there now. <laughs> right? Yeah. Amen. Glory to God. But the hope is that we got something good out of this tonight. And we'll go ahead and, uh, and just bow our heads and, and close in a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that. Lord, that when we fell from you originally, that you did not abandon us, Lord, to decay and death. Lord, but you saw fit to, to break through our reality with your presence on the mountain, with the beauty of perfection in your word, in your standard, in your character. Lord, and that you are unchanging. You're never changing. And we thank you for the blood of your, your son, our Messiah, Yeshua. We thank you that he cleanses us in a way that an animal never could because it washes not just our body, but our soul and our spirit. 
And it's not just covered over, Lord, but we're transformed. We're given life again with you. Your character, your life is sparked on the inside of us again. And may we lift that out with every day. Lord, that every day is a new day to know you, a new day to be more like you, to talk with you and walk with you as in the garden. And may we cherish every moment of that. Lord, that you, you would teach us your word, your ways, and we're receptive to every bit of it. And we're thankful, Lord, that this journey that we walk with you doesn't end in death. Lord, but we'll get to walk with you straight on into eternity. Lord, loving you and being loved by you forever. And we thank you for that, and we rejoice in it. In Messiah Yeshua's name, amen.